to designations for sake. Do we have any more questions about the production brewing process? Yes. That's a really good question. 500 years ago, they weren't milling as much as they are now. That's been like one of those technological advances. But before these fancy machines, they had machines that literally just turn, like water wheel arm, right? And it would turn and turn and turn forever until the rice was at the right point. So I actually visited a brewery in, I want to say it was Mountain Morning, which is like the northernmost prefecture of Machi Wildlife, right? And they were doing a demonstration of the way rice had been milled prior, and there was a gentleman that had worked at the brewery when that was how it was done, and he was there. And he sat there next to this big giant drum, and it was turning, and it was turning, and this motor was turning it and turning it. And he sat there with a stethoscope and just listened. And he knew at what percentage of that they kept testing him, they kept quizzing him, and he knew what percentage of the death just by listening. So there were ways, but it wasn't easy. And we could be done. Yes. Yeah, it's changed a little bit. I'm going to address that in one second. Yes. A lot's different. We're going to talk about those in just a minute. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about special designations for sake. The chart you guys have on your form is pretty accurate right now. This was created in 2018. And as demand for premium sake has gone up, things have shifted a little bit. And as demand for different The main point you need to understand is that roughly 60 to 75% of all the sake that's made is not premium or super premium sake. Basic, everyday, chug love, table sake. Right? They're not going to drink $60 bottles of sake at dinner every night at home. Nor do we. Right? There's nothing wrong with drinking a sake that's meant to be enjoyed every day. And there are special occasion sake. When it comes to premium or super premium sake, there are exceptional labels out there that are affordable. But still, even at an affordable price, you want something you can drink every day. So most sake is non-premium, basic, everyday sake. From that point, you get into levels that become very distinct and price points that increase exponentially as you go up. Want to learn about all of those? Right now. And if you pay attention to all of these words, and I gave you a glossary over there on the side, you can read pretty much any sake menu in the United States and know what you're buying. It doesn't take much, like eight words, and you're good. Seems like a lot of Japanese. <laughs> but then they all sound the same. All right, we'll start with Fuzushu. Fuzushu, table sake, basic, run of the mill, every day, on the table. Uh, you can get this in any isekai when you're there, any small restaurant or ramen bar. You can get it out of a vending machine. You can get lots of things out of vending machines. <laughs> we talked about some of those last time. We rarely see this great in the United States, but the Fuzushu is coming over the United States is relatively good. I like a lot of it, but they're only exporting good quality stuff. They don't spend the money to export and pay the taxes and do all of that and ship it, unless it's justifiable. And this particular designation, it doesn't come over a lot, but when you see it, give it a try. Absolutely. Junmai Shu versus Hanjozo. Okay, a lot of people think that Junmai or Hanjozo, one is better than the other. I don't think one is better than the other, but they are different. Okay. Neither of these tells you how good that sake is, so much as it tells you how that sake was made. Junmai means four ingredients. Rice, water, yeast, koji. That's it. That's what it means. Okay. By law, when a sake is labeled as a junmai, they have to put the milling ratio on the label. So that means that you can't just say, I made a four ingredient sake and milled the rice 3% and I called it a junmai. They used to be able to do that. They can't anymore. Then it had a minimum milling requirement. They didn't do that anymore. So now, you can say, I have a junmai sake. But if you only mill it 10%, then you can buy it. More common is like 30% for a basic table junmai sake. Okay? So it is considered a premium sake if it's labeled a junmai. It means they followed all of the requirements. They used the kind of rice they had to use. They produced it the way they were supposed to. But they have to label how much it was milled. Okay? Hanjozo sakes aren't always labeled Hanjozo. Okay? Most of them that are just a Hanjozo, not a higher level, will say Hanjozo. But after that, the absence of June mine indicates Hanjozo. If it's a premium sake, it is one or the other. Four ingredients or Hanjozo. The fifth ingredient, brewer's alcohol. Okay? We talked a little bit about that. 
They add the first alcohol in towards the end of the process to get the yeast to release just a little bit more aromatics, to balance out that sake or to get whatever effect the brewer's trying to get out of that sake. It's less than 3%, okay? Less than 3% or less than 10% of the total weight of the rice that went into it. Less than 3% is easier for you guys. We're gonna go with 3%. And then it's diluted back out. A big misconception is that because they had alcohol, it's higher in alcohol. It's not. It's not. Okay. The milling percentage is not required on um, label. I think they were weighing something for a rule for that last year. A couple years ago, it was not required on the label. I'm going back in March, so I'll have an update in my next class. <laughs> Ginjo shu. If you remember no other word from this lecture today, remember and let's say it with me. Ginjo. Ginjo shu. Shu means alcohol. It's the second highest quality level for sake. Okay? The second highest quality level for sake. It means that at least 40% of that rice grain was milled away, getting us closer to the. Very good. Okay? At least 40% was taken away, thereby, no more than 60% can be left behind. Okay? It means that they have guaranteed that they have gotten closer to the good stuff and they're producing a higher quality sake. And generally speaking, it's not generally, it's always. If you see something labeled a ginjo, it means that they took the time and took the loss of eliminating 40% of their crop. If you took 10,000 pounds of grapes and threw out 4,000 of them, that's the loss you took to identify that 6,000 best pounds. The same is true for sake. So if they have eliminated 40% of that grain of rice, they're making a quality product. They are. They're not going to waste their money and have a product that doesn't meet standards or too well in competition. So you are guaranteed that with that quality level, one, you will see a noticeable step up in price. Not huge, but you will see a step up. You will also see a step up in elegance and generally aromatics. Ginjo's can be very bright or very dry. There's a lot of diversity in the Ginjo field. I love Ginjo sake. Uh, last night, this is Suzaku. I don't know if I can make my printer thing work. But that's Suzaku. I was actually the number one seller last night at the after party. Uh, I thought you guys might like this. When I Google search Suzaku, I found this guy. <laughs> also that firebird thing, which is why it's on the label, right? Somewhere in this audience, there are some pamphlets. You have that firebird thing somewhere on them. Anybody got a firebird inside their pamphlet? Bottom, right side. I hope you're 21. If you're not, I'm a friend of 21. Don't be nope. yet. Because you're getting a bottle of Suzaku! I have to give it to you outside the hotel. We're actually have to follow me outside. I'm sorry. <laughs> I have to take you outside the hand of you. There are four. Four of my winners. Let me see. There you go. One, two, three. One, two, three. Where's number four? Right? 
There are quite a few of these available in the United States. When you see Yama and Ishiki, oftentimes you're seeing this level because it's a very expensive rice, so they're going to be very good sake with it. I highly recommend having the Gain Joe. Uh, there is one in the tasting later. Um, I wanted to do the tasting here. I apologize. The sake company offered to donate all the sake for all of you guys for this big class, and we weren't allowed. So that's why I had to have the after party. I apologize. Well, we get to party. Ultra Dagen Joe, not a real designation. Made up, fake. Super Dagen Joe, same thing. Uh, it's a word that we have that we kind of use when we're trying to give a layman's term for a competition brew of sake that we made and milled to like an extreme figure. Like there's one out there, uh, I think it's Zang Kiao right now that has one that's milled to like 91%. But you're getting diminishing returns at that point, where they had a really bad crop of rice because the, the shimpaku should be more than 90%. Okay, so you have to be careful. Some of these are very, very good quality, and I highly recommend trying them once or twice, but if you're gonna buy a $400 or $500 bottle of sake, it better be good. And so I recommend like consulting and seeing what's worth the price you're paying for it. Which brings us to Nam. Nam is a word I'd like you guys to try to remember if you can. I love Namazake. I love it. But it has to be handled with care. It's unpasteurized. It's unpasteurized, right? You have to be treated like milk. So you should only ever buy these sockets from a trusted source. And you should only buy them if they're in a refrigerator that is exceptionally cold and has been that way since the moment that it got there. It needs to be bottled, shipped, stored at the distributor or in customs, then the distributor, then to wherever you're buying it from in refrigeration. You do not drink these sakes warm. You do not take it home and put it on your shelf. You do not take it home and store it in a dark cabinet. And they're meant to be drank young. Why? Because there are live bacteria in these bottles. Okay? It's a living organism. It's milk. You have to treat it as such. If you ever buy one of these sakes and it's got little crystallized structures in it, you don't drink it. There's a sake that was sent to a chef I was consulting for, uh, I want to say it was about five months ago. And he brought it out to me, he's like, my friend sent this to me in the mail, and it's really, really good. And he poured it out, and he's like, here, have some. And I was like, no. <laughs> and he says, why? I said, it's not me. He goes, it tastes fine. I said, it's not And it just came in the mail. You have no idea where it was before it came in the mail. It's fine. He was sick out for two days. <laughs> Do not take risks with this sake, but I highly, highly encourage you to find a reputable place Try it. They come out every March. They're usually good through the summer, and there are a couple companies that even produce them year-round. Um, Misumi, the ones who discovered that A7 yeast, they produce one year-round. Uh, Gekikan produced an awesome draft socket that's Nama that they have year-round. So I highly, highly encourage it. They're amazing. They're wild. They're fresh. They're sassy. All of that that heat hasn't damaged them. They're very, very alive. They're very, very wild. Right. They're super great on the patio, really, really cold, and they're awesome with barbecue. So good with barbecue. That's my favorite pairing for sake, by the way, really tangy barbecue sauce. I love it with a pulled pork sandwich. Absolute favorite thing. 